So one more minute, we'll get started. <laughs> Excuse me, as we go, if you have any questions, uh, anything comes up as we're going along, feel free to throw them in the Q&A box. I will answer all questions at the end. And um, today isn't a huge um, note taking, you know, I really need these slides. I I'm gonna show you a progression, a basic progression of, of exercises. And um, I feel like they work really well. I think each one has to be mastered before you move to the next. It's basically 12 steps. And as you feel your clients getting more successful with each one, um, the example I'm gonna show you with Susan, and then I'm gonna show you a, a mass number of our other clients who have all gone through the same process. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you these steps with her, and this took like two and a half, maybe three years for us to kind of build up to this. And when she when she finally did it, it was just kind of like, hey, that was, you know, it was unplanned. It wasn't like, here's the moment we're gonna go for it. Let's see what happens. It just kind of happened. And um, that's when I was like, wow, we've we've come a long way from her trying to manipulate her body weight on the ground to this. So I've never done this talk before. I, I put this presentation together in just the last couple of days and um, I, I think you'll enjoy it, but it's, uh, it's not my typical, you know, the research and the science and the, it's, it's this is all, you know, kind of a, a combination of all my experiences and such working with uh, older individuals and how we've been able to successfully build these steps uh, of this hinge pattern that has been really, really successful for us. So I'm not a research guy. I don't, I don't do research. I read and interpret research and apply it. So this is a bit anecdotal, but uh, I think I have very good proof to support it. So without further ado, um, day one, two, three, four, five, six of um, TOAs, Training the Older Adult, my website, my online education website, uh, Free Education Week. We have had the greatest numbers ever. I know it's because uh, a lot of, of you are, are not able to work right now but we've had over 100 people sign up for almost every presentation we've done this week, the best numbers we've ever had. I appreciate you all doing that. And we've had such a good demand and huge request for this that um, we, we're we gonna do another one. So two weeks from now, um, look for another, another education week. I already have all my speakers lined up and presented and it's gonna be really fun. So keep an eye out for that. We'll be emailing everybody too. If you're not on our current email list, our TOA uh, email list, Go to trainingtheolderadult.com. It's the first thing that pops up. Okay, you'll see, you'll be able to throw your name in there and go from there. Um, Annie, we all appreciate, oh, thank you, Annie. I, I appreciate it, you guys. I, I love doing this. I mean, to have an audience, number one, just to have people that are willing to listen to me, <laughs> I'm appreciative for that because I really like to talk and I love to share and I love to you know be able to go through this stuff. But if you all aren't interested in this and you aren't registering to do them, then obviously there's no demand for me to do it. So I, I appreciate you, but thank you. That was very sweet. Okay, this is the blueprint, okay? This is about as sciencey as I'm gonna get for you today. I put um, years of my life and research into developing this blueprint. And this is what trainingtheolderadult.com is all about. It's about teaching this blueprint inspiring um, those trainers to see something like this, a visual that gives you a layout of your training philosophy. It's on paper, it's progressive in nature, and it makes programming on a daily basis very simple. And that's the idea with this is that I wanna use my, my template here, my example, as something to inspire you because your philosophy is different than mine. What I don't want you to do is just say, I'll just use this one and pluck it out because mine was built for me with my people under my philosophy and my environment with my equipment, right? I know that's a lot of, a lot of me's and my's, but my point is, is I use mine as just an example to you to maybe you know, inspire not to like, oh, this is the best thing ever, but to inspire how you can put yours into this template. And that's what you know, our, our total course does is it teaches all this and then we ask you to build your own and I take you through all those steps. So with that in mind, when, when we build this, or uh, when I built this, it was these five components, hinge, row, split, carry, and overhead. In that order, really the most important action that I can do with my older adults is number one, the hinge. Number two is the row. And then three, four, and five all kind of share that third place and, and importance. And it, and it doesn't mean that um, if I'm going to select certain pieces through my day, like ones will get dropped off because they're lower down. It just means with earliest aspects of the workout while they're fresh and while they're ready, 
I'm going to hinge and row my clients right from the get go because those are the best bangs for their buck. I only get them two or three days a week for an hour. So I need them while they're fresh to address the most uh, beneficial um, movements and activities first. So we hit that, but we cover all five of those actions, if not a little bit more. Um, our modalities are fall prevention and power production. And modality means a style or a format in training, not a movement pattern, which is a component, right? A component of your programming. So the modalities can be implemented in anything. I can do a fall prevention modality action while doing a hinge, while doing a row, while doing a split stance. It's just varying angles or angles of pull or different setups in their feet, et cetera. Same with power. I can make any hinge, any row, any split stance, a power-based movement, right? So I can implement those strategies, those modalities into my, my components. And then you'll notice that we, we don't have a horizontal pushing component. It doesn't mean that we don't do it. It just means that it's not a priority for every single day. So if I'm going to see you three days a week, um, we might horizontally push one day, but it's not a requirement for me when my programming comes down to like we have to do each one of these each day, right? So I just want to give you a little uh, introduction, a little tutorial real quick of the blueprint. What we're going to focus on today is primarily the hinge, right? So it's all the hinge. Uh, but we have progressions like this one I'm going to show you now for everything all the way across, plus all of our fall prevention, plus all of our power production, and even into our horizontal pushing, which kind of ends up merging in with the overhead actions is really what it comes down to. The, uh, the pivot point and landmines, I think, are the two most valuable horizontal pushing actions, which kind of lead to vertical actions that older adults can do. And I did earlier this week, I think it was on Sunday, I did uh, rigging with Rob, pivot point, press and row. And if you didn't get to see that, it's on my YouTube. So make sure you pop on there and check it out. And I'm live in the gym. I show you how to set it up, do all that. So that is like my go-to, you know, horizontal action, which is like horizontally vertical, north by northwest kind of an action. Okay. So you can check that out. All right, so this is Susan Knapp. Susan is 77. Uh, I've been training Susan um, six plus years, right around there. So I got her right when she was right around 70-ish. And uh, the improvements that we've seen with her, she is the most videoed uh, client that I have. I've got, I think, 55 videos of her somewhere right around there that I've stored. I've had probably 100 more that I took and thought, ah, this isn't the right angle or whatnot, and I ended up deleting it. But I have just this huge library of movements with all my clients. And anytime I want to do a presentation, I go, oh, I want to you know, show a glute bridge and I'll just put in glute bridge and it shows all of my clients and all their glute bridge variations, right? So I have a, a very good um, a variety of options to plug in and, and put in there. And so with Susan, um, the progressions that we took, there are, there are four floor hinges that we introduce. There are four stiff leg deadlifts that we introduce. And then there are four... Um, stiff leg that leads to a bent knee deadlifts that we produce, which we all call deadlifting or squatting, right? So we will do uh, a floor hinge, a stiff leg RDL, and then a, a squat or a head, you know, hinge uh, deadlift um, with a bent knee. And the reason that I explain it as a, a stiff leg deadlift with a bent knee is that I want my clients to learn the process of displacing their hips first and not just that vertical squat we see like rookie clients do the first time they come in where their torso is straight and, and, and vertical. Uh, they haven't learned how to displace and hinge yet. And so like get their butt out of the way and then squat down. Uh, we call it like pushing the file cabinet drawer shut or reaching your butt back for a chair that's getting pulled away from you. Like that displacement, they haven't learned that yet. So we'll teach them to, to RDL, to stiff leg deadlift, and then to stiff leg deadlift and then bend their knees to kind of teach them that component, which as professionals, you and I would call deadlifting, okay? When we do these progressions of these four, eight, and 12 actions, we start with their body weight and then we'll add progressive resistance, which, which are bands. Then we'll add consistent resistance, which is any kind of weight that you're going to put on there. Like a sandbag that you put on is 20 pounds. It's always 20 pounds. It's consistent resistance. And then eventually we'll add it up to where it's both. Um, the hip thrust is a great example. I can put a 40 pound band on the client with a 40 pound sandbag. And so at the bottom of the hinge, there are 40 pounds of just sandbag and the band is slack. And then as they hip thrust up, that 40 pound band kicks in and we have 40 pounds of pressure plus 40 pounds of band. And now we've got an 80 pound lockout, right? And then we can return. 
So those are kind of the steps that we're going to take with some of these actions. And I just kind of put these in here because I wanted to show you, you know, for 77 years old, both of these videos were taken in the last two weeks of our training uh, before we got closed down here um, of how athletic she is for 77, you know, and you're not going to find uh, a whole lot of folks um, that are still able and capable to do a lot of the stuff that she's doing at 77. And um, I, she's a huge inspiration to, to me, but also to a lot of my clients. I do highlight her a lot and let my, you know, 60 and, and early 70 year old see her and be like, this is, you can do this stuff. We've just got to train you right. And you've got to believe that you're capable. And she's had a lot of limitations. She's got a, a knee issue and a shoulder and a back. And she's had all kinds of, you know, little nagging injuries here and there. And she's worked her way through and rehabilitated through them. And it's gone really, you know, really well for her. So these are slides straight out of our, um, of our course, our complete course. And this is basically like a, a 16 week volume progression of the exercises that we would do during an adaptation phase this week one through four. Um, whatever hinge I'm gonna ask my clients to do for week one, we're gonna do three sets of 10, and then week two, three sets of 10 and so on. My loads are gonna be anywhere between a one and a four on an RPE of one to 10, a rate of perceived exertion. So my client is going to kind of rate, okay, this is, this is like a three or a four of how much I could maximally put out. So we, we allow during the adaptation phase them to kind of dictate that. And then me as the coach, I get to observe it. And I'm, I'm, the, I'm the action judge, right? I get to judge by facial expression, by posture and how well it's maintained, by the tempo in which the movement is performed, the shakiness, the recovery period, all those things come in to tell me Am I challenging them enough? Am I overdoing it? You know, color of their face, all that kind of stuff. We've seen people go from, you know, high intensity, they're talking, they're chatting, they're full of color. They do one set of something. And the next thing I know, they're, they're blanking out. They're just staring. The color has gone away from their face. They're not saying anything. They're trying not to move because internally they're going, oh my goodness, I think I just overdid it. I think I'm going to throw up, you know, all that's going on, but they don't want to show us that. And obviously that's an extreme. I don't want to, we don't push people to that. Obviously we don't want to. I want everybody to leave feeling good with what they've done. So we're asking them to work between a one and a four. And I'm kind of judging that effort too, based on those things. Tempos, um, we always do eccentric numbering first. So the eccentric or the stretching of the action. If this is a bench press, this would be first, okay? Bar coming down, 1,002, and then going up for one. If it was a lat pull down, the concentric action is first, so that'd be one second down, and then two, one going up. And a lot of people will ask, why don't we just always number off the first action of the movement? Depends on where you're starting from. There are people that start bench press from the bottom. There are people that will start as a, a high, you know, with a chin up, they'll jump up and start at the top of their action. So we can't just assume whatever action's first being listed. In the strength and conditioning world, you always list the eccentric action first, two, and then the concentric action second, one. And then if you're going to have any isometric, any holds, that would come in third. And then recoveries, what we call as needed, basically, it's as the client needs. So we'll let them do, you know, whatever, whatever amount of time they need to recover. I'll just kind of allow them to take that. And then what we have is a ready go. Okay, you'll see at this last one down here, ready go is as soon as I feel like they're ready, I tell them to go. So now I'm starting to dictate the pace a little bit. And with this older population, you know, I'm not trying to wreck people and crush them. So you see that most of the time it's as needed. Basically, whenever they feel like they're ready, I'll let them go. So we start them on the floor. We bridge, bridge, bridge. As I kind of deem the success of the movement, uh, I'll progress them to the next action, to the next action. And these are them. Okay. All the way down this list. That, 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 all the way down to the bottom until eventually our last horizontal hinge is a barbell and a band hip thrust. And when the client can do that pretty well, we're going to, depending on whatever week this is, as we go through, it might take 16 weeks, it might take 50 weeks, it might take two weeks. It just depends on their athleticism and what they're doing. Then we're going to progress on to the vertical stiff leg and then with a bent knee, our vertical actions. And that will start with deloaded hinges and work all the way down to eventually them doing a strict you know, hex bar deadlift off of the floor. So I'm going to, I'm not going to go through each one of these. That's really what the course does is we kind of go through each one of those pieces individually and we teach those. And at the end of the, the whole course, we're in week five right now, coming up on week six, uh, which is never too late to join. I'm, I'm not meaning to plug through this, but you're welcome to if you want. Um, 
at the end of this whole thing, we're doing like an eight hour live stream into the gym. And we're actually, I'm going to ask all of you to do all these with me. I'm going to teach and demonstrate and do all the exercises. And it was supposed to be a live event. We were supposed to have everybody come to Sacramento and do this so I could coach you and you could feel it all. Um, because of the current situation and such, this is not going to be realistic to think that we'll be able to travel everyone and that people will feel safe doing so. So we've switched that to online. And basically, I'm going to ask if you can, you know, go to your gym, even if it's closed, if you can go to your gym, you know, and just watch this on your iPad or your computer and go along with us. That way you can learn all these actions really well, more than just seeing my clients do it, you know, in these videos. So some of the first steps that we kind of start here with is just, we call them manipulation. And, and this with a lot of clients where I learned this from was after my hip replacement, the, um, the first one I had, I rehabbed really, really well. The second one, I was overly confident. And though the mistake was in cut placement, uh, a, a dislocation was inevitable. It was gonna happen. But because I was so overconfident, it happened really quick. I was in the hospital for a day. I got sent home. I was home for two hours. I went to sit up to go to the bathroom and my hip dislocated. And so after that surgery, I was super gun shy and just waking up from that surgery and them asking me to get out of bed and to walk. I had to kind of, I was right in the center of the bed and I, I was nervous to even try to inch my way towards that side of the bed. So with a lot of our clients, we will kind of practice these manipulations of shifting the body and we'll do shoulders and hips or hips and then shoulders. And you kind of feel like you're doing like an inchworm, but laterally. And we're trying to build up this kind of foundational strength of learning to manipulate your body in different directions. And so this is um, a very base level foundational style movement that teaches, you know, hip engagement, gluten engagement, all the posterior aspects of the body. So it depends on the client where you're starting with, but in many cases, you know, you could get a client who's late seventies, early eighties, um, who's had some, you know, bedridden limitation issues where getting up and down out of the chair, definitely getting up and down off the floor is not realistic, or they, they're having a lot of issues in doing so. This is a great starting point. You know, you can get, we have the really soft, you know, the rogue plyo boxes, the ones that if you crash and land on, you don't hurt yourself really. We put out those, you know, two 24 inch boxes and we have them sit on that and lay back and they'll bridge and they'll shift left to right. And we'll practice that by bringing the floor up to them. And then as that's kind of mastered and they get more mobile, we'll start to lower that down to 18 inches and then 12 inches. And if they can get to 12 inches, basically they can roll to one side and they're on their knee. They can get up and down off the floor. And a lot of our really older clients, once I'm confident and capable in them getting up and down off the floor and I've seen it, we won't really practice that all that often, maybe a couple times a month, just so I know they're good, but they're here to train with me. They're not here to be uncomfortable practicing getting off the floor, which is not terribly comfortable for a 90 year old or an 85 year old. As long as I know they are capable of doing it and we practice it every once in a while, we'll do everything to like a 12 inch box. I'll have them sit to stand and that's way below parallel for them to get down to. I mean, it's good work. It's, it's steady work for them. So we'll implement this to start off and just practice these different angles of attack and different coordinations of getting them to engage, you know, their musculature. And then when they're ready, we'll start with ground based, uh, meaning shoulders and feet, both on the floor. We will start with ground based. Oops. We will start with a ground based bridge. And this can be with body weight first. And then, like we said, onto the bands and then a consistent load. So Susan is kind of built up in this video up to the point where, um, she's able to hold, you know, 65 pounds here on the bar. Shoulder blades are tucked in and good, and she's got her toes up, and she's working a good rhythm of what we call a wheelbarrow lift. The idea is that from her hips to her shoulders are all one attached piece, like a wheelbarrow. And if you lift up on the handles of the wheelbarrow, everything lifts. There's no rolling up and down of the spine. And that's probably the biggest mistake you can make with bridging. Is, is the spine not being locked into that good, you know, lumbar curve, that, that uh, natural lordosis curvature that happens, lock that position in and then lever from that. Just like if you were bracing to goblet squat or to back squat or something along those lines, right? So we get into that good leverage. So we would start with, you know, a body weight bridge, and then we would add a band like you see them doing here in the center one, we call these self anchored bridges, okay? We would add that band to this setup over here. And then eventually we would move on to a, a weight with like a sandbag, a 20 pound sandbag, or a pair of 10 pound dumbbells, something like that. And then we'd introduce the bar. But all of those are done floor based, meaning feet and shoulders are both on the ground. The next step from that 
We are going to elevate their feet. Now, with both of our clients here, they both have shoulder impingements. Jerry's got a separated AC joint, and Susan has a torn labrum. So extreme external rotation bothers her and Jerry, and full pronation kind of bothers them too. So ideally, when we do our floor anchors like this, I would have them go palms up, and they would retract both shoulder blades under and pull into the floor. And what that's going to do is engage all the posterior uh, musculatures that are going to help me anchor that band down while bridging the hips up. So the whole backside of the body is on, which is, to me, is like one of the coolest things you can do while bridging is pretty much turn on every muscle you got. And so it's a lot of times you feel like the upper half isn't doing anything when bridging. This self anchor is a great way to do it. Now, if you look here really detailed, people are like, where'd you get these bands? You know, the mini bands, right? Like the XLs and the, the small little mini bands you get at Perform Better. Well, we replace ours because we use them so much. We replace them every eight to 12 weeks. And um, basically we'll see wear and tear on one or two and we'll have one break and we'll be like, okay, let's get the new set out. Well, what do we do with all those old ones? We loop them all together. So if you look real close right here at Jerry's hip, that's a knot, okay? And then on the other side of his hip is another knot. So we just took three green bands and loop, pull, loop, pull, and we made a long band. So now we have a use for these worn out old mini bands that aren't going around the knees and going over people's shoes and wearing out even more. And we basically just use them for this, for self-anchor bridging, because we self-anchor a lot. Almost any time we bridge, we do this. So we have mastered on the floor, our bridge, body weight, maybe with a band around the knees, then a self anchor, and then a consistent load, okay? Now, the reason I didn't do step four with this, which is the band and the weight, is most of us do not have a setup, a platform setup that includes anchors. What I mean by this is like, see what Susan's, her feet are on here? They make platforms like this, they're padded, but they're eight feet long, and you can lay on those hook the band over you like a seat belt. And now these hooks here hold the band down. You don't have to. And then you can add your bar or a sandbag. Most gyms don't have that. I've only seen a few places that do. So my point being is it's really hard to do a band and a consistent load without an apparatus like the one she's on here. Okay. So for the floor to start off, we do body weight, resistance of a self anchor like this, and then a, a consistent load. And then we move on. Elevating the feet is going to give an increased range of motion. We're going to get a higher wheelbarrow action here as they come up, okay? Remember, their hands should be at least be neutral, if not turned all the way palm up, okay? We made little modifications here for their comfort levels. Toes are pulling up and back, and they're digging their heels down into these boxes to the point where they're trying to flip the box towards them. It's that much hamstring and gastroc recruitment to where you're trying to pull your heels to your butt and the first time people do that, they're going to feel like they got stabbed in the hamstring. Like it's a whole new experience to pull up into a bridge than it is to push up into a bridge. And so I, I kind of jokingly call it like you're trying to stand up while laying down because you'll see their shirts start to cinch up to their neck. They start inching across the floor. You know, the box is moving further away. That means they're pushing, they're quad dominating every time they come up. So if you dorsiflex, pull your heels down and back towards you, almost like you're trying to pull your heel out of your shoe and then bring your butt towards those two actions pulling in, basically just make you like pop up into your high bridge and your hamstrings and your glutes did all the work. So it's a great way to teach your clients, put your heels on this box, now tip it over while you bridge and you'll see them, oh, like instantly they'll grab them. Oh, what was that? Did I tear something? And you're like, no, you've used your hamstrings for the first time. Welcome to the party, right? Like that's the first time they really now do that again. And you'll see them almost every time for like three or four workouts in a row, you'll see them grab and kind of rub and be like, oh, they just have to get used to it, right? It's, it's just a new muscle action. So once we master that with body weight and then progressive resistance, like you see them doing here, and then you can add load to this. But remember, you're getting up high into like a declined position. So if they don't brace the weight with their arms, it's going to fall on them, right? So we'll hold a bar or a sandbag, or we have sand rolls, we have dumbbells, we have um, uh, sand mats, we have all kinds of different stuff that we can load them with. They have to brace with their arms and push the weight away from them while they bridge up. And I'll show you a couple examples of that here in the future. And then once we're ready for that, if you have one of these fancy hip thrust benches, you can use a regular bench that's anchored as well. Um, we're going to go to an elevated hip thrust. And this is kind of the ultimate goal uh, for the floor based or the horizontal hinges, I should say, 
is that we are going to get to the position where we can lever like a teeter totter. See how her head and her chest, everything is locked in one position and she's moving it all in one piece. Okay. Chin is down like she's trying to hold a softball to her chest and then she levers her chest like a teeter totter back and forth where she's not rounding and tucking her butt and then overextending and arching on the way down. So we get that good leverage as she masters that I'll add the band over her hip, have her hip thrust that. Then we'll take the band away. I'll give her like a 30 or 40 pound sandbag. We'll hip thrust that. And then this is the best one now that we can add both. You can do the band and the sandbag. And now we're really maximizing, you know, a consistent load with an aggressive hip thrust. Remember that's the difference between bridging and thrusting. Bridges are tempo one, tempo one, tempo one, tempo one, where the hip thrust is like half a one. One, two, three, half a one. Like you want to jet it up there. You want to blast it up there. And that's the benefit of this where we start to work into that power modality is that we're going to start working a higher tempo. Now, if the resistance isn't enough for them or if they can't do it mechanically correct yet, we just don't go that quickly. And eventually we start to build the strength where she can thrust up pretty quick, pretty aggressively, and then work that eccentric, you know, recoiling of the hamstring and then pow, fire, you know, fire it back up there each time. Um, when we come up. Okay. So that's our floor based actions. And then we're going to go to the standing. And so we have a couple different options for these as we go through. Um, one of the more advanced, I, I, ideally, I would start with this guy here. Okay. Just a simple standing hinge in a row. We have a deloaded one as well, where the band is above for those that need to kind of work with that step first. And as they hinge, they actually get lighter. Okay. I have a whole nother talk about that. I don't want to spend too much time on that one because that, that could take 20 minutes. But basic hinges here, just working displacement and adding some kind of complex component, almost always a retraction, okay? A row, low row, high row, face pull, chest pull, whatever you want to do into this. We'll start with that. And then we'll start to work more vertical, okay? More vertical like a simulated rack pull. Um, not everybody has racks that they can hook up bands and pulleys into like I do. So I, I like to rig these up on occasion. These are just sandbags with carabiners and pulleys, okay? And you can hook up. This is my daughter's five pound lifting bar. We just put that in the center so she can kind of simulate a rack pull, top of the knees, no lower, up into a little retracted shrug. So tighter, heavier, easy on the down, gets a little lighter, tighter and heavier. She's more exposed or vulnerable in the hinge. She's stronger and less vulnerable at the high point. So it's a lighter weight up to a heavier weight. Great progressions. I love resistance bands for building confidence in these standing hinge positions. And then eventually we'll kind of work her into a regular RDL or if we put out safety catches there, a full rack pull where she can deload it and return. And notice that little retraction at the top. We always put in that shoulder blade pull back retraction. It's not a up, it's not a circle, it's not up and back and down, it's just up and back. One action, okay, so that one's a little too far forward. Up and back and one consistent action to get our clients to feel that action of retracted rhomboid trap. Yep, and we're just constantly working on that, you know, bringing the forward head back, bringing their shoulder posture back. And we can do that under load here, even greater benefits, okay? And then to really kind of maximize our uh, fall prevention balance modalities, we can work once we really feel good with the bilateral aspects, we can start working on some unilateral aspects in contralateral format, but working on one leg and one arm at a time, and you can see her balance Apparently my balance with the camera too is a little tricky. I'm trying to get Jerry, that's her husband in the back back there, working on a variation of a sit to stand. So we do this little teapot action. This is one of her first times getting introduced to this. So her foot's sticking out a little bit, her leg's not as straight, but you can see her working through the steps, trying to keep her chest up, trying to get her leg up. She goes down and takes that weight, balances, fights the fall over, comes back down, leaves it on the floor, comes back up without it. We call that a take it, leave it. Hinge down take the weight, okay, she's got seven and a half pounds, I think there, back down, leave the weight. And so we've kind of worked into those progressives from a, a horizontal hinge or even a vertical hinge, allowing some deloading if needed, uh, practicing the displacement of the hip, practicing our hinge, to adding some progressive resistance, to adding consistent resistance on this one, right? Consistent load. We could even marry these two together if you guys have the gear and the setup to do it. Uh, you can do self anchors. I'll show you those here at the end as well, where you can loop a band around the bar and back to their own feet. So they are the anchor of the band as they come up. Super easy, a little hard on the bands, but super easy to set up. 
and then eventually work into some of the unilaterals. But point being is this is all stiff leg work, all you know, hinge based. Uh, knees are soft, but they're not bending yet. Okay, and then we work to the full um, sit to stand actions to start. And when I call these hinge with a bent knee, meaning that we're starting from the top, it means we're not pulling weight off the floor yet. Okay. Now, first thing I want to say is this video in the center, Susan is doing it this way because I, of, of the angle I was in in the gym and I wanted to get a recording of it, but it's not the way you want your clients to do it. You want your clients to always set up on the bench like this one on the right, okay? And the reason for this is if Susan comes down and over rotates, meaning she comes down really quick and over rotates backwards and she falls back, she just lays down on the bench and the weight you know, dumps to the side or it smushes her, which is better than if she over rotates in this middle one, she falls off the bench, lands on her head and the weight definitely falls on her, right? So everybody agree, hands up, scouts on her, you would never have, repeat after me, I'll never have, good. My clients sit on a bench like you are demoing inappropriately in this video, good? Okay, good. All right, so you guys promise we're never gonna do that, all right? So some of the basic ones we can do here, uh, this is a sand ball. I love these guys. You, they have handles built in. You can throw them and slam them, do all kinds of great stuff. Basically, she just I handed this to her, and we're doing just a simulated uh, put down, but without the put down. Notice how far her hips move back, way back into her hinge, and then she sits back. And our cue with this is that if you were going to put this down, it would fit right between the arches of your feet, if not right between your heels. So we're really cueing on where the implement placement will be not in front of her. We want everything to go straight down. So now we've kind of mastered the idea of hinging her with the straight legs, right? Still soft knees, but mastered the RDL or the hinge or the rack pull, if you will. We're now displacing the hip the same way to start and then bending the knee down to make sure she's um, comfortable being loaded. Number one, even though these weights aren't real heavy yet, comfortable being loaded, but comfortable uh, D degressing down through her range of motion, eccentrically stretching down through her range of motion and being able to change direction and accelerate back up with load. So we'll start in space like this. Now to get extra strong, which I'm a huge fan of these, is you take away the eccentric stretch, you take away the catapult action. And so that's what this sit to stand action does. Remember, never on the bench like this, okay? Like the one on the right. So as she comes down, her quads are stretching and her glutes are stretching and they want to fire and snap her back up. But when she sits down and takes the load off, uh, all that stretch reflex goes away. So she has to do a strict strength contraction every time. Re-engage the muscle, force her up and come down. This gets people really, really strong. When you have clients that struggle getting up from a sit to stand position, start them on sit to stands in like a chair with you know two or four of those Aranex pads, those two inch foam pads in there, and they might only squat down 15 degrees, right? But teach them to sit down, stand up, unload, get them to do like 10, and then give them weight and overload that very simple sit to stand. And then the next workout, take away one of those pads, do the same thing. And the next workout, take away another pad until you get down to a point where they're maybe two or three inches above parallel and you're like okay i see them struggling now they're having to rock they're having to valgus collapse or they're having to round their back make it a little lighter and just hammer that exercise until they know they have to push their knees out push their feet down push their butt back push their chest up and we call that the, the triangle feet down okay butt back chest up that makes this really nice triangular which is a very you know structurally sound strong position to lift we we force that triangle action feet down butt back chest up okay and you work that triangle to death just keep hammering that in their warm-ups and their cool downs until they get strong at that angle with some decent weight 10 or 15 pounds and then you take them down a little lower again and this action Muscle on, muscle off, no stretch reflex. This is just a pure strength development activity. And it gets people strong quick, especially if they're coming down slow and working like a little time under tension. If you do two by twos, two seconds down, have a seat, two seconds up, gets them super strong with this, okay? So we hammered this with Susan because I really wanted her to get comfortable hand, you know, handling some weights in this. This is called a Kung Fu grip that she's doing here too. One hand is open on the outside, the right hand is in the weight. 
So her right arm is doing the majority of the work right now. The left is just kind of the stabilizer and the next set will switch. So we're working on some of her, I call it bilateral dominance, even though I'm holding something bilaterally, one arm is gonna always, almost always upon fatigue, it's gonna dominate, it's gonna take over. So I'm, I'm gonna train into that. Her first set, I give her strong arm, her right hand, and then the next two or three sets, we do the left arm to try to emphasize like 60 or 70% more work on that one side. If that's the weaker side, I wanna catch it up a little bit. We're always seeking muscular equality from side to side as best we can. Will we ever achieve it? You never know. It, it depends on the person, like how early or how late you get them, you know, as balanced as you can get, and then being able to measure that to see if you really are developing that, right? So this is the one that I love to show. It's impressive, to, in my opinion, okay? So she's doing a staggered sit to stand. Notice her feet are staggered. Left foot's back about three inches or so, okay? Now she's cranking these out. I think she does like, eight on each side for three sets of eight, three sets of 16, eight on each side. She has a 35 pound dumbbell that she's holding right there doing this. And we just kept going up and kept going up and I just kept bringing her more weight and she could keep doing it, it really sound like this. And it's when we got to this point and I'm like, okay, if you just did eight of those, you switched feet and you did eight more with 35 pounds, you know, and we're practicing kind of getting out of the bucket here on that deep squat, I think we're pretty close, we're pretty much ready to be able to put 55 to 75 pounds of pressure around her in a hex bar and let her start working you know, off the floor with us. So this was the day that really kind of turned the, the corner for me and I'm like, she's ready. We're ready to start pulling weights off the floor. So traditional, you know, just kind of holding weights, replacing it in the right spot, working your sit to stands, unloads, re-engage different heights, and then eventually loading this up even staggering the stance a little bit. Remember, we're seeking muscular equality with each side. So I like to stagger those stances to allow some uh, development of the rear leg. The, the, the back leg is gonna do a little bit more work because it's the first one to engage upon that action. And you might see when the right leg's back, you might see uh, it, you know, straight on, perfect stand up and sit down. And then when the left leg's back, you'll see their whole body shift to the left and then rock to the right as they come up because they're trying to compensate so much for a weakness in that. And so a lot of times you can, you can start to pinpoint these little things with your clients. They're trying to cheat to be able to do the action because you're asking them to do it, but they're too weak to do this. So instead of saying like, oh, let's do 30 pounds on the right and 20 on the left, let's do 20 on both sides until it looks perfect together. We always train down to the limitation because if you train around it or up beyond, you're just making a bigger gap, right? Uh, the right side is going to continue to get stronger and stronger and the left might as well, but there's still this gap. It doesn't matter the load that I'm lifting. I'm still not balanced. So I need to try to seek that equality as best I can and then go on. And in some cases, our clients, especially with like pullovers, we'll do, I call it unibilateral. I know that's not a real thing, but I don't know another word for it. You have two weights, you're laying on your back, you don't let them touch, but you do a bilateral pullover, but the two weights are independent. So you in a bilateral, I trademark that, you can't take it, no, I'm kidding. I, I think you just call it bilateral, but because they're independent, I wanna make emphasis to let people know this is being done unilaterally, don't let them touch, right? And so you'll see, watch me real quick, you'll see them go back the first couple and they're even, and the next thing you know, the dominant arm starts going and it's like, are you doing a dance move? Like what the hell are we doing right now? It, everything gets out of whack here because that weaker arm, it just can't keep up anymore. And they get frustrated and I'm like, we're not going on until we get this other arm to catch up. And as long as there's mechanically nothing wrong with it, right? Like, like Jerry, her husband has a separated AC joint on that side, he, he, we're not gonna catch up until he gets that fixed, which almost 80 years old, he's not gonna do, right? Doctors won't touch him with that. So we work with the best we can, but I'm still not gapping him away of like, do a 12 and a half and a seven. I'm just gonna work sevens on both sides. And as long as I'm keeping that right side pretty capable and we're still challenging the left, that's fine with me, okay? So I want them to try to seek that equality in there. And if they can't, that frustration in a sense will motivate them to, to get a little bit better, put more emphasis on this. We'll even start to use some of those exercises as warm up components so they get extra work on it, right? So if you see something like that with the staggers, start putting that stagger in their warm up. Instead of having doing a bilateral kettlebell deadlift, have them do staggered stance, you know, bilateral 
uh, or, or I guess it technically it'd be a contralateral pickup at that point, right? So, I mean, think about some of those little pieces. They're just little tweaks, little riggings, right? That are gonna make things a little bit more efficient for your client specific to their, to their need. Oops. All right, so now these proper pickups are one of the best things we can teach. So the one on the left, when we're, anytime we're addressing an implement to pick up off the floor, I wanna straddle that weight if I can. Um, it's gonna teach a good sumo stance or a traditional stance depending on how wide the implement is. It's gonna always put them in a much safer position than if they're reaching their hands outside, especially with two independent implements. It's really difficult to pick up two implements. Imagine like two paint cans three feet apart and now I have to squat down and reach kind of around my knees to get to these paint cans where if the two cans were touching each other in the center, I could just sumo stance over it and squat down perfectly, right? So these rounded over positions, we wanna avoid those as much as possible with the heaviest loads, with our socks, it doesn't matter. So we teach the, the, um, the straddled stance approach. We'll properly pick that up. And then once it's picked up, we will ask them to place the weights at their side. And so she transfers the weights out and locks her shoulders back into her loaded carry position. And then I'll ask her to transfer that weight, carry it somewhere else. So her body's getting used to what it's like to hold load. And with each step, there's impact, impact, impact of about one and a half times her body weight. Remember, it's not three times, she's not running. So about one and a half times plus the load. Then when she gets there, you guys saw that, she did a straddle stance, brought the weights in, set them down, turns around. So we're not turning around with the weights, okay? Turns around, straddle stance, proper pickup again, brings the weights to the outside, sets them, and then off she goes on her carry. So when I'm getting to practice or pickups on each end, and I'm developing that compression strength, uh, the uh, osteoporosis or anti-osteoporosis based compression of load being carried, I'm getting grip strength, I'm getting retraction strength, all these great things that are gonna eventually help my deadlift, right, come about. And so we'll do this with up to like 35 pound kettlebells in each hand. I and mean, she's a stud, she can move some load, right? There's no doubt that she's strong. And I think probably a year earlier, we could have gone to the hex bar, but was she ready? Was she ready to succeed or did I just wanna see her do it, right? So I took, our, I took our time, I took my time with this to make sure we went through each step and that she wasn't gonna have any issues. I don't wanna work backwards with people. If you injure them because you're too aggressive in our approach, now we're not achieving their goals, they're hurt, they're going backwards, they talk bad about, you know, all these things can happen. And though it's an accident and you're trying to help them, I'd rather just ease off things a little bit and consistently train than overtrain once. You know, it's like redlining your engine. I'd rather just keep revving it up and getting it close and do that consistently and every day just get a little bit further and a little further than redline it once and it blows up on you, right? So, so baby steps with this, especially if we're trying to get to the point where they can lift some heavy weights and, and for, for them, you know, respectively some heavy weights. So we'll practice this straddle approach, proper pickup, weights on the heels, you see her shift, transfers the weight, carries it. We'll practice that with up to, you know, for Susan, up to reds, up to 35 pounds in each hand. That's 70 pound deadlifts. Well, now I know if she can do that with 75 pounds, 70 pounds, I have a 55 pound hex bar plus tens on each side. So she's at 75 pounds, she's ready to do this. Now, when we talk about counterweighting, okay, how am I doing on time here, I'm doing good. As we talk about counterweighting, when she goes to pick up these kettlebells, the weights are down and in front of her. And even though she's right on top of it, she's still not exactly centered of the weight, it's just a little bit in front of her. So where is the counterweight to down and in front? It's up and then back. So like right between her shoulder blades is kind of the counter to where she's picking up that weight. The transition to the hex bar now is, is kind of ideal for us because now there is no counterweight, it's center weight. Basically her whole body all the way around, center spine all the way down is ideally kind of evenly distributing this. What would be perfect, which would make it absolutely uh, evenly distributed, is if the hex bar had two more bars welded to the front right here, if there was another one here and another one in the back, and you could do like a 10, a 10, a 10, a 10, then you truly are centered because right now she's a little heavy left and right, right? So we're still, you know, center mass as best as possible, little emphasis on the right to left, but still pretty solid. Ideally, I would love it if somebody invented that or maybe I should trademark that and do it and put those weights in the front and then you've got a true center mass weight all the way around. It's, it's, there is no counterweight at all then, okay? So now she's ready to pick that up. 
we're working on these good contacts, our cues, our shoulder blades kind of being engaged, the chin staying tucked in so she's not over arching her neck. Knees are pushing out to keep her from, you know, collapsing the knees. When you transition into a hex bar, everybody wants to pull their knees in because they're afraid of hitting them with the bar. We'll actually cue them the other way. Push your knees out where it almost rubs on like your fingers and your thumbs. And that just basically gets them right to where we want them. But in their head, they're like, I'm overdoing it out, right? It just brings a little emphasis as to like, get back to normal, get back where I want you. Proper pick up, proper put down. We see this often, I'm sure you all see this too. You know, you ask somebody to pick something up, they pick it up perfectly 10 times and then they bend over and they put it down wrong. Or they go to put it back and they're slopping it around, bend over and you're like, why? We just practiced three sets of eight, perfect. And then you bend over like that to go put it away. Like those, those kinds of actions, we wanna make sure that we're emphasizing this lift is a transition to real life. So no matter what it is, your shoes, socks, a dryer lint sheet, a bag of groceries, a grandkid, you know, a toolbox, uh, the, the, uh, the garbage cans that you're going to drink, whatever it is that you're picking up or countering, whatnot, we got to be in a good technical and sound position to do that. And then once we see this action is done well, then we can start to up our weight a little bit more. Okay, we're adding a little bit more on there. We're starting to get some more, you know, range of motion, a little bit more depth into this. You know, see all of her buddies over there watching. This is a new PR attempt for her. Okay. She's loading up pretty good, moved up a bar, right? And then one day we just happen to have this bar loaded up, okay? She's got 110 pounds on here and she does 10, 12, and 14. Uh, in this actual video, which is a post on my Facebook, she did three sets of eight. And then we came back in the next couple of workouts and she did 10, 12, and 14. And so we took 14 reps and we projected that on our, our one rep calculator and that came out to 162 pounds as a projected one rep. And she at this time weighed like 158, something like that. She's a little lighter now. But the, and as soon as she does it, she looks at me and she goes, I hate to tell you this, but it, that was pretty easy. Like when you watch her do it, and here we go, it's, it's not that hard for her. And I mean, she was so ready. We, 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 like I was saying, we probably could have done it earlier, but she just crushes this. And uh, it's, it, was a, it was an awesome moment for me because knowing where we had started with her, with that manipulation on the floor, with her back issues and her shoulder issues and all this, and the way we were able to kind of build and progress her up and take these step-by-steps, it, it gave me faith in my programming uh, to know that this works and that people can get very strong, that older people can still lift like pretty good weight. Now, could I put 160 pounds, 160 pounds on there and have her pick it up once? I could, am I gonna risk that? Probably not, I'm, I'm definitely not, right? I like the projections of this, being able to say like, if, if push came to shove and you had, if I loaded this with 160 pounds, you have the ability to pick it up, yes. But I, I'm always gonna go with projections for this demographic. There's no need for us to risk this. I knew she could lift this, I knew it. I didn't hope that she could lift it. We don't hope lift, not with this, not with any demographic really, anybody we work with. I'm not big on hope lifting. Hope lifting, you know, if you encourage people to like, well, we'll see, let's hope we can do it. You know, you want to have people lift things that you have absolute confidence and know they're going to be able to do it. Okay, so I saw some questions come up. If you have questions, pile in. Like, please, I'm gonna have I'm gonna have time. I don't mind staying on, but I want to highlight a couple other people so you know it's not just one person who's like gone through this and you're like, okay, you got one stud. Maybe she was a gymnast before. She wasn't. She's just a normal everyday lady. Okay, so uh, here's Barbara, 74, picking up a 63 pound kettlebell. Not a huge deal, but once you figure out that she's had sciatica for 30 years, she's had back surgery, she has fusions, all of this that have come in to address this, uh, to have her do this, and she wanted, she loves wrestling, so she, <laughs> she's got her head, her head gear on, and she wanted to be able to do a replacement here with this, and we sent it to her sister, and it's a great video, and she gets done, she starts flexing, and you know, she's yelling at the camera at her sister, what do you got? And she's stepping, you know, asking her to step up in a challenge, she's super cute. But uh, very competitive. She really wanted to do the green kettlebell, okay? Here's 90-year-old Mary working a 45-pound uh, lever to deadlift, okay? I've been working with Mary for almost a year. Mary could not sit to stand uh, to the bench. We had to elevate her quite a bit, and she couldn't get up and down off the floor. Um, she can do all that now. And we've been able to progress her through these steps. Now, is she at the hex bar? No. Nope. This is her first knee-bent exercise. 
and it's on a lever because the leverage activity, one body's lever versus another lever, the mechanics of that work up really well to be able to move some decent weight around. So I can ask her to pick up 45 pounds and lever that up and get all the benefits, the osteoporotic components, the arthritic components in the hand, everything else we've talked about, bone and joint and, and you know everything else, tendon, to all that stuff with a decent load, but in a pretty safe way to do that, okay? And then we have Annabelle, 73. Annabelle has done more since, but she's doing uh, 85 pounds here. I think she did like three sets of 10 or three sets of 12. Uh, I love the videos because you see all the other ladies in the group in the back, like everybody in here working together and crushing it. They're like a little platoon of, you know, 65 plus year olds and with a couple of 90 year olds in the back there. It's really fun. Like I, man, I miss this. This is my environment. These are my people. So she's got 85 pounds on there. She's crushing it. I mean, just knocking these out. And this was a lady that, you know, we had a really hard time getting her to be able to squat deep enough to grab a kettlebell, let alone get down with this heavier load. Now, Gary, you look at Gary, 75, 125 pounds, okay? But back injuries, knee injuries, shoulders, this was a lot of work for us to get to this point. And, and still, when he did this, his knees were a little touchy. His back felt a little touchy. He wasn't super confident. And I was like, hey, where do you feel good at? And he goes, well, I like just the two, you know, 25s on each side. That's great. I don't care how much they eventually lift. The point is, is I want to be able to challenge them to ranges that they feel comfortable and I'm seeing benefit from. So 125 pounds, no problem. We do that all day, right? I'll take that every other week and keep him strong and, you know, locked up in the core here. Uh, here's Linda, 70, 105 pound rack pulls. Linda's got major knee issues. Uh, we'll, we'll never get her to pull from the floor comfortably. I've got a few videos of her doing hex bar deadlifts off the floor. And it just, it's just not great for her. She's not real comfortable doing it. But the benefits here from all that vertical loading for us in a range of motion that's really good and comfortable for her we're controlling that range. This is a true rack pull. She can't go any deeper because the safety catches are there. If she goes like two inches deeper than that, her knees are gonna overbend, her back's gonna round. So I just cap it. I don't let her go any deeper to be able to control that range of motion, put her in the safe of positions as I think she can be. And then we're gonna move some decent load. We're in center mass. So we're trying to take away that counterweight, right? I mean, that's a really good, comfortable lift. Barbara, her training partner, not quite there yet, not ready for the load, so she's using sandbags, okay? Susan's husband, Jerry, people look at this and they go, oh, his shoulders are a little round, right? His butt's not moving as much. If you guys could have seen where he was before, this is 80% better, huge improvements. Now, mind you, separated AC joint. I can't get him to pull his shoulder back. There's no leverage for him to pull on it, right? So we're trying our best to get that retraction in there, drastically improved. But again, controlled range of motion, as deep as I can get him, but not overly heavy, you know, 65, 75. Oh, and this one, 85 pounds. Yeah, he's got the little fives on there. So we've got some extra load on there for him to work with. Okay. Bill, 73. Oops, jumped the gun on this one. Bill, 73, does 185 pounds on the hip thrust here. Uh, I could not find that video. Is uh, him in this position. He's on the other side of the room on this other rig up that we have. And he's got like 95 pounds on the bar. And then he's got a uh, like a 85 or a 90 pound lockout band on the other side. And he just crushes this thing. I mean, just hammers it up. And I think he does I don't know, six or eight reps. So that equaled up to like a 185, uh, one rep if we were to do that. Again, that's projected. And then here's Leslie. Now, you know, 30 years younger than some of my other clients, but this is her back. Look at this thing, all fused together, all these nuts and screws and paper clips. What is this over here? I don't even know what that is. Look at all these bolts and screws in here. And her goal when she came in was, I want to be able to deadlift. I said, well, mechanically, once we got her doctor's clearance, he's like, you're not going to break anything. It's just, is she strong enough to get there? And our goal was to get over 100 pounds. Well, she ended up doing 105 for a set of 10 or a set of 12, whatever it was here. You know, and knowing that these are the mechanics we're working with, as long as she's able to hold her hinges right and hold her positions right, I'm good with this. Did we go heavier? No. I, I, I was very happy with, you know, three sets of 10 or whatever we did here at 105. And we will re, you know, touch that weight every couple of months. But she typically works around 75, 85 pounds as we go through. And, and, you know, we're, we're finding good comfort there in these resistances. Okay, a couple other notable studs, Marjan. Uh, Marjan had huge issues with doing deadlifts and we just had so many problems with her back and all this. And so we built up to the point where I was like, I just wanna get you over a hundred pounds. And, and so we eventually we did that. 
and she was looking, she goes, how much is that bar over there? And I said, well, it's 115. And she goes, let me try to do that once. And she'd just done a hundred for a set of 10. So I knew she could do that. Right. And I'm like, okay, go ahead and pop on there. This is a lady that um, does not self praise herself ever, but gave a big smile and gave me like a high five and a hug afterwards. When she did that, she was pretty pumped knowing that she had just picked that weight up. And, and that made my day, you know, she's, she's one of those like, Oh, it could always be better. Uh, but you know, she, she achieved something that day. She knew it was respectable and she was proud of herself. Here's my master's downhill skier. Uh, major knee repairs, surgeries, all kinds of stuff, doing her box squats, you know, sit to stands here, box squats at 115 pounds. Ruth is just a, a different level. She's one of those, she's the one client I have where I'm like, she's just a gifted athlete who's still got it, can still lift some awesome loads. And I'm not big on back squatting unless we can box squat it. I think the box squat has a huge benefit. Back squatting, it, just too much eccentric loading, having to control the bar and redirect it. At the end of the box squat, you get to redirect that, you know, that load. Now, mind you, Ruth, I've been training her 16 years. She's my longest tenured client. So knocking out three sets of 10 here at 165, that's no projection. That's 165 on there, crushing it. A barefoot lifter, like she's, she's one of the few, like you could have been a power lifter had I found you, you know, 40 years earlier, just a, just a badass, 66 years old, still skis every, you know, every ski season, even with all those injuries. Okay. Uh, here are my, oops, this guy here, Frank, this is my where, where's Waldo. I love this guy. I, I get to train him seasonally. He lives with his son in Florida too. And so I haven't seen him in a while, but 77 years old, you know, doing sit to stands, not ready for the floor. Here's Barb, she's 65, she's got 30 pounds. Leslie, the one with the fuse back, 40 pounds. And then some of our other guys that have like some pretty major back injuries and such, we still find ways to load them. This is called a cross section sit to stand, okay? Cross section here is like an anti-rotation component. And then we're using the fat bell here for some additional load plus the band. These are the self anchors I was telling you about before where the band wraps under the foot and you can put it over the weight or you could put it over a bar, you know, and do your self anchor actions from there. So all hinges, all different levels, and depending on the person, you know, I've shown you, I don't know, six or eight people, maybe 10 people that did deadlifts off the floor. As far as my 60 and overs, that's about all of them, you know, but I've got another 40 that don't do it. We're not there yet. They're not capable of doing it yet. Will they eventually be? I, I hope so. Maybe not. But is it the end of the world? No, I, I don't care. I'm just trying to find that level of resistance, that level of challenge that I can work with some of my clients here. Here's Betty. Four pound sand ball, okay, her hinge, she sits, she unloads the weight, has to come up without it. We've got her boxed in there where she can't overshift, she can't rock, she's stuck there. Okay, now she's gonna take the load, complete dead start, no momentum, just strict up, comes down, unload, replace that weight, right? We're just learning like pure strength. That's one starting from the bottom, and then Joan here started from the top, so she comes down, unloads, comes up, takes her weight, unload, back up, replace it at the top, okay? So you can rig these up different ways. Still all hinges, right? We're find, trying to find the, the hinge that's most progressive in nature for our clients. Some of our clients, Eva, she can't hinge, but I still wanna get that vertical pressure for her to work on the bone densities. Um, she's got fusions and back injuries and such where vertical hinging for her really bothers her. So we do all of her horizontal bridges, all of her horizontal hinges all go really well. I've got probably 30 different horizontal hinges from foot staggered stances, one on the wall, one on the floor, all these different variations just to give her different angles to work at. But as soon as we break at the hip with her standing, even with just her body weight, it flares her back up, really sciatic issues. So she can brace and hold some load here and just kind of work some old school shrugs just to get some action in the weight. And then one of my greatest success stories here, my client, Mary Beth, you know, 75 pounds, she knocks out eight or 10 of these. And the smile at the end of this is why I do my job. Because this is a lady that when we met for day one, she goes, I don't want to lift weights. I don't want to lift anything over five pounds. I'm going to get hurt. I don't want to get bulky. All the things you hear. And, you know, after six or eight months, however long we kind of walked, you know, walked our way through here, I led with education explaining and look at that, that nod of approval. I got it right there at the end. And it followed with a high five and a little hug from her. Um, she was convinced then that, okay, resistance training, it's working great. She felt good, you know, and, and has been a believer in our service ever since. So we lead with the education components with that and really try to emphasize to our people that, you know, that these are, um, 
extremely beneficial. The science supports that. It's my job as the coach and the art of coaching is to try to find which one of these and what progressions and will best you know, apply to your body and give us the best challenge. And if we find that and that's as far as we go, then that's it. And I can manipulate that to find, you know, more band or more consistent load or different angles to find the challenges. But a lot of our clients, like, you know, I put up a video of me doing hex bar deadlifts. I won't do those again for another two or three months, but all my other training pieces allow me that when I want to test that, that I can, you know, it's just, it's finding those pieces. If I do that every week, my, my back would inflame, my hips would ache. You know, I have to be really smart with my programming and know when I can challenge it when I can't. Just like every good program, you have to have undulations in your training. We have to have undulations in the programming pieces that we put together with older pops to make sure we're not over abusing or using different movements that are, are what we think are going to cause, you know, great responses and improvements, but could just cause, you know, more damage to the client as we go. So there's constant feedback, constant, you know, how does this feel? Are you sore? Are you achy? And really baby steps. I get nervous when I do presentations like this because I don't want to see videos of your people three weeks from now deadlifting this amount. Of, it's going to take months or years for you guys if you're not currently doing that to go through the steps. Baby step your people. Celebrate the four pound pickups and the 10 pound pickups and like those things, you know, with our older pops. I'm, I'm not, there's, this is nothing braggadocious about this, that I want you to understand that it's possible that with the right candidates, you can build them up and give them some very good lifting goals and great benefits from that. You know, Susan's only going to be stronger, longer now, better posture, longer, less pain in her shoulders and her hips, you know, all that from these mechanics that we've worked and just drilled into her. And I am the judge, right? I am the one that's like this lift. No, you have to stop. Could she do more? Absolutely. Could she do more reps? Absolutely. But it's not to my standard. The, if the technique's not perfect, we're not lifting it, right? And I just shut it down. I'm like, no, we'll try this next time. Not in a bad way. Not like, you suck, you're blowing it. Not, nothing like that. It's just like, oh, that's good. Let's stop at six there. You know, let's back off the weight a little bit. And, you know, two weeks from now, we'll try again and see how they do. So, just to wrap up here, uh, I, I'm happy to stay on and do questions. I know we're at our hour here. So anybody wants to stay on, if you have to take off, no worries. I understand. Um, Evan and I, we're going to do this presentation. It's an arthritic training blueprint. And we go through every major joint of the body and how we would kind of focus on a limitation with these arthritic components, what um, correctives we would give, and then what resistance training pieces will help improve it. And we're going to do that at FAI. Uh, as a pre-con, but we don't know if FAI is going to happen. So if it doesn't, if it ends up getting canceled, we are going to do it online. So just keep an eye out for that. We don't have a date yet. We're still kind of waiting on that. And then if anyone is interested in the TOA course, okay, I, like I said, we are coming up into week six. Basically, if you wanted to sign up, we would get the other five weeks sent to you. You get the recordings and the PDFs, just like we're doing right now. You get everything that everybody else has gotten. You can watch as you, you know, as you can per your schedule and get caught up. And then as we keep going along here, we're going to have step two is a live mentoring. It's in the gym. I have a big screen. We get you on there and we can do Q&A back and forth. And I help you build your blueprint. I help you build your strategy assessment form and your movement observation. We do all of that together. You know, with 50 people, we get everybody on there and I take you step by step by step. And we do that whole thing. And then the week after that is the live into the gym where you'll see me and hopefully you'll be at home doing it with us too. And I'm going to take you through that entire blueprint, all those exercises step by step. So you can feel it and see this, the sliding progressions instead of just seeing my clients do it and me talk about it, you get to experience it. So feel free to go to training the older adult.com. Check that out. And uh, FAI is our sponsor of our whole week here. So if you wanted to sign up FAI 200 saves you $200 I'm not trying to gouge people through this time. I understand that. Um, if you want to do this, okay, uh, $400, we have payment plans. You can do two $200 or four $100, one every month. Really, whatever plan will kind of work for you. I, I want to open this opportunity up to people right now so you have something to invest your time into. You get CEUs, et cetera. So if you want to do it, please check that out. If not, no worries. And there's tons of stuff on my YouTube page. There's a lot on there. There's 80 videos. You can learn stuff on there too. Um, I'm, I'm all about trying to just provide you guys good content, but I spend a lot of time building these blueprints and I've put it, invest a lot of time into researching how I want to implement them and to teach that to you. Uh, I hope you understand why we do charge for that, uh, because it's a, it's a well-invested system. And, and I think people that are in it are really seeing that. So, uh, we'd love to have you. 
tomorrow, 9.30, we're doing uh, the, another, another free session like today. Just register online, you'll get the link. Um, it's just an open, open forum, open discussion. I'm basically the moderator. So uh, if you have a question, you can raise your hand, you digitally raise your hand and I'll, I'll, I'll go, Oh, Bianca, what do you got? And she'll say, Oh, I have a you know, question about, are my gyms going to close yada, yada. And whoever wants to answer digitally will raise their hand and we'll have them on. Uh, but Evan Osar, Mark Nutting, Lindsay Vestola, Rocky Snyder, Ryan Glatt, Lauren Eric, all of them are going to be on with us and uh, offering uh, opinions or answers, whatever you need, and plus everybody else that'll be there. So feel free to join us with that. And then again, two weeks from now, I think we're gonna do another uh, education week just because we have the opportunity and a lot of individuals that wanna come on and share their content with us. So should be pretty cool. So thank you, trainingtheolderadult.com. That's my uh, phone number there too. That goes direct to my cell. So if you ever have questions, you wanna text me, fire away on there. Um, I am running an online business now and this and my family and the gym and everything else that we're trying to do. So it might take me a little bit to get back to you, but I will get back to you. All right, questions. Let's open this guy up and see if anybody has any, any burning desire to ask any questions. All right, uh, I work at a YMCA in Pleasant Hill. I work with older adults and it's wonderful to see how you work with them. When this is over, I am definitely headed to your gym to take your course. Oh, sweet. Well, hopefully you'll pop on and do it online with us. So we'd love to have you on there. Uh, is, that, is it Josie? So thank you very much, Josie. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, very nice. I'm, I'm working on accepting compliments and trying to be a little bit better with that. So anybody else, any comments? I see a couple of hands that popped up on here. Uh, Bianca and Michael, do you want me to allow you to speak and answer, ask a question. Bianca, let's do that with you here. If you have your hand digitally raised on accident, go ahead and pull it down real quick, but, or else I'm gonna come to you, okay? All right, oh, Bianca pulled her hand down. Okay, Michael, I'm gonna come to you. You ready? I'll give you three seconds to pull your hand down if you don't want me to call on you. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Where's my cursor? All right, Michael, what do you got for me? Oh, you might have to unmute yourself, Michael. I permitted you to talk, but you'll have to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Down at the can bottom you of your back? screen. There you go. Yeah. Can you go back to the slide with the two kettlebells? The slide with the two kettlebells where she's doing the... Uh, yeah. From the ground. The replacement. Sure. Yeah. Let me, let me go use my fancy technology here. That one. There we go. This one here. Yeah. So she's setting them down. And then she walks them, what, about 15 paces, sets them down again, and then yeah. pivots. Uh -huh. And does that for we do, a, few we do, a, few, yeah. a few sets? We do three lengths. So it's part of our, uh, we call it a transfer progression or a transfer test. I don't like to use the word test because it freaks everybody out. So it's a transfer progression. And basically what I'm trying to do is see how much load can they move 75 feet from the first white post, which is where I'm standing here, is there's a white post to my right, to gotcha. our last white post is, uh, is 25 feet. So she'll do a proper pickup transfer. And again, I'm judging as she's doing this. Is she waddling? Is she, is she unable to control the weight? When she gets here, is she properly putting it down? Does she turn well? Does she properly pick up? I'm judging her knees if she's round in the back. And so I'll have her go down, back, and down again, and she'll finish here. And when that's done, I'm like, good, let's go to the yellow kettlebells. These are the 18 pounders, the, the eight kilos. We'll go to 12 kilos, so 26 pounds. And then we'll go to uh, 16 kilos, the, the 34 pounders. And we'll just keep going until we kind of see a point where she's like, all right, it, it's getting a little shaky. It feels heavy or she's waddling while she carries. She crushed the red ones. And our next jump to blues, it went from... 36 I think to 44 and she's like no nah, I don't know so we tried it with like 40 pound dumbbells and she got down and back and she was like I'm pretty good and I said yeah I agree I like I like this with reds so it just kind of gives us a barometer of what kind of weight can she transfer and can she do some proper pickups in between and then if I get to a point where I'm like all right I don't want to go heavier with her what else could we kind of test in this I can put a clock on it but I don't want her to run I just want to see right. like can she consistently transfer down, back, down in 40 seconds and then go do some other exercises and come back and do it again in 40 seconds and do some more exercises and again in 40 seconds. Now I'm seeing kind of a muscular endurance component with her that I'm testing that shows uh, consistency in her ability to, to carry load and transfer it. 
And that can be another test piece for me. What I don't want her to do is I don't want her to, to do one in 40 seconds and then the next two are like a minute and a minute five. Then I see that she was either sandbagging those other two or she like over gassed that first one just to try to get, you know, as, as fast as she could once. I'm looking for consistency if we're going gotcha. to put time. But typically I just want to see the, the length and the judging of the action done well and with a, you know, a decent load, not maximal load, but a pretty decent load that, that we feel comfortable her moving. Gotcha. Thank you, Robert. Sure, you bet. Yeah. All right. Anybody else have any questions? Let me get back to my, I lost my Q&A. Hold on just a second. Let me get out of here. I lost my Q&A box. Where'd it go? Where are you, Q&A box? Hmm. Oh, there we go. Okay, uh, Heidi, can you send the worksheet you showed at the beginning of the webinar for us to print out? So the blueprint, is that what you're asking for? The one on, on page one? I can absolutely share that. I'm happy to share that with you all. So that would be this guy, right? That's the one everybody wants. So Heidi, I think, um, I think you may have asked for that earlier this week. I thought I emailed that to you, uh, but I will send it again. Remember, you guys are all gonna get the PDFs too at the end of the week, so on Sunday, I'm gonna send everyone that signed up for anything, everything this week, all the PDFs from all of it. So instead of trying to get each person what they want, I'm just gonna send it to everybody. So you'll get them all in like a, a Dropbox um, pull down so you guys can just pick which ones you want. So I'll definitely do that. If I were to sign up for the TOA course now, um, when do you when do you open? Would it be able to come for the next TOA in person? So, so uh, Josie, I don't know if we're gonna. Obviously, we want to do this again next year, and ideally, we would love to do the one in person. Our ultimate goal was to travel this and to have it have everybody do this online, and then I was gonna do one in like Seattle, and then do one in Boston. Well, I don't know wherever we were gonna go, and everybody could come and do like the part three with us. Uh, we want to do this first one here just to see how things kind of go, but we kind of have a wrench thrown into it now. I'd like to be able, I wanted that third day of hands-on with you guys. That way, if you have a back issue or a shoulder issue, I can show you how we can kind of manipulate and rig things for you. And that gives you a learning experience of how to implement it with your clients, right? It's so different than when you get to do it versus seeing people do it or seeing videos. I, want, I wanted you guys to feel that. So I'm hoping that uh, that will be something we get to do in the future. Uh, if, if we can get there. But yes, the it's open now and you can get everything that we've, you know, kind of backfiled. You'll get all that sent to you. You can view them and watch them as you want and then join us, you know, this Monday live and continue on with us from there. And it's all your content. Once you guys, you're in, you're in, you get to keep that stuff and reference it. You know, you have all the PDFs. It's all yours. The only thing you don't get access to are the videos. You can see them in the recordings, but I, I can't give you the videos of the library of exercises. My clients haven't given me permission for that just to share during my presentations like this. All right, um, anybody else? Uh, I will, okay, I got you on the PowerPoints, Mary Jo, I got you there. Any other questions? Um, oh, the progression sheet. So you want, so you did get the blueprint and you're asking about, um, oops, you're asking about this one. Okay, this guy? Yes, that'll be in the PDF. I can send you these blown up too if you want them a little bit bigger. Uh, the PDFs, when I send it, it's page. It's one page at a time. It's not six on one page. So it'll be full size in there. So you guys will definitely be able to see these on here and go through those progressions uh, you know, as, as you see them now, just as big. All right. Anything else? Feel free to ask now. I'm checking my comment box. Okay. Participants, any more hands coming up? I'm looking there. See a comment that just popped up. Thank you, Becky. I appreciate you all. I see lots of thank yous. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for being on here with us. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got some good stuff from it. Uh, anything else that I can do for you, please let me know. And uh, check us out on Instagram, Facebook. Check out the YouTube page. I'd love it if you'd subscribe on there. I'm almost to 500 followers, so that would be cool. And uh, I think that's all. Thank you, everybody. Have a great week. Stay safe out there. And uh, we appreciate you joining us for TOA Education Week. We will be back in two weeks with more speakers. So it's going to be pretty fun. I'll see you all then. Take care.